And then two is facing it and dealing with it to the point to where it doesn't mean that you're not good enough or that you're bad. It just means there's some parts of you that needs to be restored because they were broken or um, you had a very distorted picture. And most of us, our views on life are tainted because of our life experiences and our trauma that we've incurred. There's a voice crying out in the wilderness The most important and crucial period of your lives for what you do now and what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life shall go. And the question is whether you have a proper, a solid, and a sound blueprint. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth, and your own somebodyness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth. And always feel that your life has ultimate significance. And secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have, as a basic principle, the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. You're going to be deciding as the days and the years unfold what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. Once you discover what it will be, set out to do it and to do it well. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Finally, in your life's blueprint must be a commitment to the eternal principle of beauty, love, and justice. Well, life for none of us has been a crystal star. But we must keep moving. We must keep going. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. from the Bible. Love. God. God is love. Uh, my mom, full of love. Fear. Uh, dying without fulfilling my purpose. Battling my depression. Different perspective on life now. A kid that was born and raised in Mississippi. Um, he was a kid that loved life, loved his parents, loved church, loved Sundays, loved Wednesday. Uh, my daddy, my, my father is a pastor, so he was always having uh, revivals and stuff like that. J little Jimmy, as they called me back then, was really uh, a kid that just enjoyed everything about church because it's what my parents were involved in and, uh, and that's just kind of like the, the life that we came to know. And I think that when my parents divorced and they started having issues is when little Jimmy um, uh, began to be shaken in his faith, uh, to be shaken in life, and to be shaken in everything that he had believed that he had the perfect family and when my mom decided to leave Mississippi, little Jimmy got in the U-Haul truck, but Jay got out of the truck when we got to Texas. Mm -hmm. 
not only the divorce of my parents, how they divorced, and then the things that went on throughout the marriage and stuff like that. Because, you know, at that time, my dad, who he was on Sunday, Sundays was not who he was Monday through Saturday. And that was very hurtful for me because I, I saw a part of my mother one night that I'd never seen. I walked into the room and she was crying and I asked her mom, what is wrong? And she didn't say what was wrong. She said that she was okay, but I knew that something was going on between her and my dad. And slowly but surely, I started to find these clues around the house and started to watch my parents' behavior. I was a very precocious kid and I was very uh, mature for my age. And so you couldn't just tell me anything. And seeing certain events that take place with my parents and how my dad reacted and responded and how he handled my mom really broke me because for me, what you are preaching and teaching to other people on how to treat their wives and how to handle their families on Sunday was totally contrary to how you handle us. And that's where my brokenness, my brokenness started because this was a man that I admired. It was a man that I, uh, I had looked up to. My dad was a football player, awesome athlete, good looking guy, very charismatic. Um, you know, he just, there was nothing that my father couldn't do in my eyes and not realizing that the one thing that he would do will cause a myriad of issues within myself because, um, you know, he wouldn't come to my football games. You know, my dad was always doing something. Um, and so he was not uh, the father that I needed. And I wanted the validation from him. I wanted to hear him say that I could be like him. You know, I didn't hear that. Uh, uh, I only have one instance where I remember when I was seven years old that my dad told me that I wouldn't that I wouldn't be like other kids. I held to that, but he never told me what that meant. Um, he told me that I was different. You know, my parents knew that I was very uh, different spiritually. Like I was, uh, I had a close relationship with God as a kid, um, so I was very uh, intelligent when it came to things of the Bible, things of the spirit. And my parents saw that and they cultivated that. But my dad never gave me clarity on what that meant when he said I would not be like other kids. My brokenness looked like anger. A lot of anger, um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, abusive behavior toward myself. You know, I would take things and hit myself. I was a cutter as a teenager. I would cut on myself a lot. Um, it's just a lot of resentment, a lot of bitterness, and just a lot of just, you know, wanting to hurt people for what for that reason that I became so infatuated with football because it's like I can hit people. Because in my mind, I felt like I could, I can cause pain to them physically from the pain that I was dealing with internally. Uh, when my mom moved us to Texas, I was around a bunch of kids who had both parents. That was triggering for me. Um, it was triggering um, to only see my mom at a game and uh, not to see my dad. It was triggering um, when somebody said that, you know, you know, you just take things too serious. And like, I had a chip on my shoulder and the chip was that, you know, I was still hurt because here I was, a 13, 14 year old kid, having to be the surrogate father to my sisters and having to be this sense of uh, a source of strength for my mom because she depended on me as well. And like, you know, my mom looked up to me, even as a 13 year old kid, like, you know, she would ask me, what did I think? You know, um, I was this, this patriarch of my family of us and, you know, because everybody wanted to know, well, well, Jay, what do you think we should do? And um, carrying all of that was just triggering within itself because I didn't have a, a, a childhood. I didn't have, a, I most definitely didn't have a, a, a life as an adolescent because I was always on edge. I was always feeling like I had to fix something or I had to solve something. And um, all of that was, was heavy. At the time, 
you don't know that it's a lot because you're in it. And it's almost like it, 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 you normalize it, you know, without, uh, without, without a conscious thought. You don't ever think that this is not normal. Feeling misunderstood um, because, you know, when my parents divorced, my dad had seven brothers. Not one reached out to me and said, hey, nephew, we got you. You know, we're going to look out for you. We're going to help you. I had cousins in the NFL. Not one reached out to me. You know, uh, nobody said anything to me. Um, so I think not having anybody to act like they care really hurt, hurt me a lot. Um, and my mom has 12 sisters and four brothers, and I mean, and, uh, uh, and you know, her sisters, you know, of course, like my mom is a very, side of the family is very spiritual. Of course, they was praying, but not a lot of men reached out to me, and, and we had men in our family, and that was very, I mean, so anytime as an adult that I felt unheard or understood, misunderstood, I was triggered. And many times as men, when we feel unheard because you're either trying to over talk us or you're trying to talk at me rather than talk to me, it's going to set me off. Um, and then I think just overall as an adult man, it's just not being able to have my father um, to just go and talk to. Like, I didn't really know what a mentor or counselor was until like I was probably like a junior in college. I met a pastor that kind of came into my life, Pastor Juan Wesson, um, that really became instrumental. And he was around for about a good year. And other than that, I had never really known men to really pour into young males. I'd never seen it because dang sure nobody did it for me. And so as, as uh, adulthood, uh, I think a lot of men are triggered by not having the support of either their father or some male influence and feeling like that you always got to have it figured out or you got to some way be in a position to solve a problem. And I think that within itself is, is triggering. I, I know most definitely it's, it's emotionally exhausting. I was smart as a kid. I was a straight A student in Mississippi. Uh, made the A, B on the roll. And I'll back up seventh and eighth grade with my worst years scholastically um, as a student because my parents were having issues and fights, arguing, I mean, we could be sleeping all year, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that was just, that was a norm. And I began failing, and I remember during that time, um, it was almost like I was intentionally getting in trouble because I wanted his attention. I wanted him to say something. I failed the eighth grade on purpose, but that, that time, man, was just like, oh my gosh. You just want somebody to just reach out and just say, hey man, like, I get it, you know. My brokenness most certainly uh, affected how I approach relationships because I, I approach relationships from two, from two perspectives. From my dad's side, I was very passive aggressive. I mean, being a therapist, I know in depth and detail what that terminology is, but I was shut down. But I saw my dad do that. Like, I remember days my mom was like, you know, where were you last night? You know, why didn't you come home? And all those different things. And, and I remember him not answering questions and not, you know, talking and shutting down. And, and that's what I would do whenever there was an issue in, in dating or relationship. I wouldn't talk. I would shut down. I would get mad. I would punch a wall or punch something. Because again, I still had all this anger and aggression. And the aggression that I exuded, it wasn't so much that it was the other person, but it had a lot to do with my own internal issues that was projected 
in that situation because whenever, again, when I felt misunderstood, these things happened, right? I felt that. So it affected uh, me in, the, in, in relationships. Uh, and on the other side of that, from my mom's side, I was a very loving guy. Like I would give fast. I would fall in love fast. And I'm not afraid to say that. Like I would give, I would be all in. And you know, I mean, and I think part of that was in some way it's okay, but it can create very unhealthy patterns because what it does is that you begin to give from a place of emptiness because you're trying to love somebody on a level that you want to be loved. And that's what I was trying to do. And eventually as an adult man, I would choose women that were in the situation as my mom was. They needed a savior. And not that these were bad women, but I, I was trying to rescue something in them through my own brokenness from what I saw with my parents. So what I mean to clarify that, that a part of me was trying to rescue my mom and the women that I chose. Brokenness affects every part of our lives. And anyone says different, they're wrong. It affects how we see money. It affects how we see ourselves. Um, it affects how we even view ourselves internally. Because for me, I didn't know if I was deserving of being happy because I didn't have a childhood to be happy. So not only did the environment shape how I saw myself, it also shaped how I viewed life. So I saw life as if, man, you're just trying to get through. So it created this survivor mentality. And I think now being on the other side of all these things, I understand that God didn't place us here just to survive. He wants us to thrive. And that's the difference from when you're looking from a healed lens rather than from a broken lens. So everything is always survival. I now look from a different lens, right? I'm looking from the lens of not for who the person is today, but who are they working to become? Because I'm at a place in my life and that's this position that who I am today, I won't be tomorrow because I'm always evolving. And, and I've learned too, to see people as they are and not how we want or how we wish for them to be based on potential. And, that, and, if, and, and if you're going to accept this person, you have to accept that they may or may not change. So my growth now allows me to use wisdom uh, and not just to see from an infatuation perspective, but to see from a growth and from a purpose perspective, like, okay, if I get with this person, what do I get? And we're not talking about the, the sexual and, and all of the stuff that TV and, and uh, uh, the world shows you that, hey, you know, you're gonna get vacations, you're gonna get dope nights out to post on the gram. It's just it, it, like that, that, all of that is superficial. So my growth allows me to really look at the aspect of a person, not from judgment, a judgmental or a place of skepticism, it's more of observation that you are observing okay, where are you going in life? Um, and if you're going there, am I going there with you? Or then if I, and then if we are traveling this road together, what does this look like for the both of us? And, uh, because I think when you start to ask questions like that, you, you can better evaluate not only who this person would be in your life, but who will you be to them? And then what will you be to each other? So, and I think that's the deeper um, level of, of a thought process that I see now enter into relationship from my growth and through healing. I lost people that I outgrew. That's what I did. I lost people that I outgrew. Uh, but I, I, I've been on this journey, man, for many years. And I... <laughs> And it's one of those things because I, I look back and I'm like, there was a lot of people that I started, because I started this journey probably back in 2012 um, um, with my nonprofit programs, with my books that I've written. 
when I, I started all of this stuff at 30. I started going to therapy around like 28, 29, 30. I had this epiphany that God wanted me to do something, but at the same time, I was still struggling with depression. Um, at 30 was the time that I attempted suicide again. So I, I had so much going on at 30, but then as I continued to evolve in these different spaces and in and, and these different elements of who I was becoming, I didn't necessarily see that I was losing these people. It was almost as if these people were exiting on their own. Because when you're growing, you don't have to tell people that you're growing, you just grow. And if they're on the same plane as you, they grow with you. But there's about five guys that I met eight years ago that we have all continued to grow together. And so that has been the beautiful thing about this journey that even the people that I've lost, the people that I've gained and met on this journey that has uh, uh, celebrated my growth and I have celebrated their growth as well. And, and that's important that people, that you're surrounded uh, with people who celebrate your growth. I was very self-destructive and that I was on a road to really, to, 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 to lose my life. And it's what, and, and it, because growing up with PK, right, and you know, being filled with the spirit and, and being in church and, and the things that I've done and, and, and working with ministry is to accept like, man, I wasn't perfect. It's to accept that I believe in God, I trust in God, but man, I'm struggling right now. Because I feel like most believers have a difficult time trying to, or have a difficult time accepting and embracing that they don't have it together. And as, as much as you want to, and what they don't realize, this doesn't change who God is. Because we don't have to protect God's reputations. But what it does is it, it, it reveals our humanity that as you are a believer, that doesn't change, but you are still a being, a human being within a life or a human experience that is trying to navigate through the difficulties of life. And many of the things, like, I didn't realize my dad dealt with depression. My dad dealt with suicide. I didn't know none of these things until I got older and my mom started talking to us about these things. And so, um, I think accepting that was just like, man, dude. Because as a kid, my faith was just like, dude, there's nothing that God can't do. And at that time, I'm just like, I'm not sure if God can do this because I'm struggling right now. And that was really the hardest thing to accept because I almost felt struggling with my depression and my suicidal thoughts because it was daily. I felt like, man, I'm letting God down. Why am I having these thoughts? People who are suicidal or, or attempt suicide, we're trying to get rid of the pain. Um, two things I want to uh, convey. Two things is people who do self-harm. I was a cutter, so uh, I would inflict self-harm on myself. So I am inflicting external pain because I am hurting internally. And so what happened is, is that I can fix my mind that I'm going to hurt myself knowing that, and basically I am trying to numb internal pain by saying, this don't hurt. I'm gonna just cut myself, I'll just do this. These things that are debilitating in a sense, and you're trying to get rid of the pain because as a man, it's like, here I am, 30 some years old, football is over. You don't have that as a coping mechanism. You don't have that as an outlet. You don't have the support system because football is a community. I didn't have a coach to validate me as a man because that's what coaches do, right? Hey, great job. You do something bad, hey, get your ass over here. You know what I mean? So it's like, and but all that because for us, it's just like kids. 
when kids have structure, we know that's where love is. If there's no structure, there's no love. So if coach jumped on my case, I knew he loved me. I knew he wanted me to do better. So I didn't have, like when football left, all of that was gone. So in my mind, it's like now here I am stuck with this pain at 30, what dad did at 13. And I'm just like, the hell with this? Because I don't know, how to, I don't have my coping mechanisms. I don't feel like I can do anything else. So in my mind, the pain was still there. So it's like, dude, let's end the pain. And that's the other side of it is that people are not trying to really end their life. We're just trying to end the pain. And that's what led me to the, the suicide attempt. After the second attempt, I realized that all right, this is not going away. And that's really what it came down to. It's like, you're gonna have to deal with this and you're gonna have to address this. Uh, I, I did have a spiritual encounter with God where he spoke to me and said, hey, it, it was in a sense like, I won't save you again if you try this. And I think two things what that led me to do. One, I had to believe that, all right, we do this again, you're out of here. <laughs> but then secondly, I had to trust him that he had a purpose for my life because he said, I have a purpose for your life if you follow my direction. And then thirdly, so I said two things, but three things, but thirdly, I had to seek out help to begin to talk through these feelings about my dad, about my childhood. To this day, I'm, I'm I'm healed and I always say I'm I'm healed in so many areas, but I am constantly healing. And because healing is a journey and it should be a journey that we are always on because it's neither straight or short. So it's one of those things where you just hop on and somebody says, well, where are you going? I'm just going to stay. I'm just going to stay the course. And that's what healing should be. And there are some things that I'm still healing from just from seeing stuff in the church has nothing to do with God. God is who he is. I want to make that clear. God is God and every man is a liar. And I believe every tongue, every knee should bow and confess that God is God. However, people are people. A lot of reflection, a lot of uh, detoxing, uh, reprogramming, unlearning, I would say mostly unlearning because a lot of our behaviors are learned behavior from the system that uh, has shaped us, whether it was our family system, it was the environment, uh, so society, uh, so many social constructs that have shaped us, whether it was music and unlearning that, that the love that God has for me is unwavering because I often, we often feel that we're not worthy of love. And we, and we often feel that we're not worthy of God's love, God's love. So what that teaches us is that we're not worthy of love from man or, man, man, man or woman. And so we always feel that we have to perform to get something. Well, I gotta do right if I want God to love me. I gotta buy this car, I gotta buy this meal if I want this girl to like me. Well, I need to, you know what I'm saying, be like these other women if I want him to marry me. So we are always in this performance mode. And my healing journey has been so much reprogramming and redirecting and mostly reframing. Reframing the things that I went through and understanding that it is not what you went through, but it's how you view and perceive yourself in what you've gone through. And that's the beauty of therapy. So my healing has been it's been ugly because I, I've had to look at the ugly parts of me. Um, I had to look at the things that, because in healing, it's like you got to look at the things that you don't want to touch without gloves. Like you, you got to pick that stuff up. Like, ugh, you know what I mean? You got to look at it. Leaving here without creating a legacy. That's my biggest fear. I think I found my purpose, so I'm not threatened by death. Uh, I know who I am, who I'm becoming. Um, but yeah, that's my fear is leaving here, not having a legacy. I want the world to know like, hey, 
he, he was here. Acknowledging that you were hurt, acknowledging that you were offended, acknowledging that you were, you know, you were abused, acknowledging that you were mistreated, acknowledging that you were overlooked, acknowledging that um, you were lied on. Uh, forgiveness is the acknowledgement of the things that have happened to you, whether it was from the, the perpetrator, the predator, uh, the abuser, the attacker. Um, and it's not to dismiss who did it, but the acknowledging of the event empowers you to the point where what happened doesn't dictate who you become. So forgiveness is embracing that, man, I can't change it, but I can change how I see myself outside of what happened. And there's so much freedom in that because when we hold to the who, we give power to the what. And this is what causes us to walk around and live in bitterness. And when you get to that place, there's freedom there because the forgiveness is not for them. It's for you. It's to free you to move forward. And I intentionally said move forward because so many times we've learned how to move on and not move forward because moving on can be anywhere. That can be, you can move on and go backwards. You can move on and go lateral but to move forward, meaning that you're going ahead. And so that's what forgiveness is. My name is Jay Barnett, and today I choose to be the best version of myself.